you're thinking you know how to play gecko right well let's see how that stacks up against the big leagues in this video we're peeling back the layers of valorant strategy dissecting the play styles of two gecko players who live in completely different worlds one is fighting for their life in the trenches of platinum and the other in the elite and strategic realm of radiant you might be wondering why should you care about this comparison well here's the kicker no matter where you are in your valorant journey understanding the decision making tactics and strategies of higher ranked players can seriously level up your game. By examining these two geckos side by side, you're about to see what separates the good from the great, and most importantly, how you can apply these insights to your gameplay. So stick around, because we are about to expose the strategic chasm between Platinum and Radiant gameplay. And trust me, you don't want to miss this. First, let's introduce Gecko a bit. Gecko is a formidable initiator whose toolkit is designed to provide his team with crucial information and safety while scaling up. He's got a unique twist though. His abilities, while destructible, can be reclaimed and used again after a brief channeling period. This means that the best Gecko players aren't just using their abilities, they're recycling them and turning each round into a relentless barrage of utility. Gecko's abilities can massively shift the tide of a round, but they're not just a one-size-fit-all solution. Each ability requires careful thought, precise timing, and a dash of bravery to ensure that they're used to their full potential. Skilled Gecko players don't just throw out abilities. They think strategically about where and when to deploy and how to recover those abilities to maximize their impact. The real magic of Gecko shines on all offense. His ability to reclaim his utility means that he's always pushing forward, driving his team to maintain offensive pressure. But this isn't just about throwing your weight around. The art of Gecko lies in knowing when to push forward and reclaim your abilities and when to hold back. So we've got our Platinum Gecko and our Radiant Gecko, both playing with the same abilities but with very different results. What makes these playstyles diverge so much? Stick around because we're going to be covering just that. But before we get into it, remember if you're really looking to master Gecko, we recently updated a brand new Gecko course on the skill capped website. We'll teach you all of the tips and tricks needed to play Gecko at the max level in Valorant, along with some insights only Gecko mains would be able to provide you. This is something you just can't find anywhere else because we are the only site offering personalized courses that help players improve. In less than an hour, you can learn everything there is to know about Gecko, from cool little tips and tricks that will get you free kills, to how to carry your matches like a Radiant Smurf. We We've got it all. Not to mention, we're also the only site that offers a rank improvement guarantee, so if you actually don't for some odd reason start to climb, you'll get your money back. We do this because we believe in our service, and you should too. So check out Skillcapped with the link in the description, and we will see you there. Let's get into our breakdown though, first taking a look at our Platinum player. We'll start out by breaking down three rounds from our Platinum Gecko, and then we'll look at a Radiant Gecko and see what they do differently. For our Platinum Gecko, we're going to be doing them justice, and only really focusing on their better rounds of the game to provide a fair comparison. Because I could just take a look at rounds like this one where they agreed to pick up their abilities and lose the spike in enemy territory when the opponents are on an eco but what purpose would that serve i'd be comparing our gecko's worst rounds to the radiance best ones which just isn't fair instead let's take a look at this one our hero starts out the round in mid with their phoenix looking to fight Phoenix throws a flash and they walk out in mid off of that. This could be a little risky considering Phoenix flash isn't really a lot of utility to fight mid and also our hero isn't really ready to trade him anyway. I mean once the flash is thrown the jig is kind of up. At higher elos Phoenix isn't normally just going to be fighting mid solo so most players would probably hear this and assume that there's more than one player here anyway. With this in mind it's probably just better to use Dizzy with the Phoenix flash to provide that extra bit of security and power in this mid take. After all you could pick up Dizzy afterwards anyway so it's not really like it's going to cost anything. This is kind of the big strength of Gecko in the first place, the fact that you can recycle his abilities. If you compare Gecko to say like a Sky Flash for example, Gecko's Flash is only really going to take one bullet to break and it doesn't blind players nearly as fast. Sure they're both kind of similar in nature, but I'm willing to bet that most players would rather have a Sky Flash over a Gecko Flash if they couldn't pick it back up. But because you can, that's where a lot of the value comes from. Nevertheless, this works out okay and they start to scale up through market. From this point, they take contact and B lobby and this is the position that I want to talk about. While it may be slightly risky, our Platinum Gecko here might have had an awesome opportunity to make a play and do a little bit of limit testing. Now of course the fight would be a 2v4 so it is a little bit risky but hear me out. Our Phoenix is flashing and if Gecko were to use Wingman as well as Dizzy right now, it would be very difficult for these players to deal with all of this util dump. They're all stuck in one area and there's not really anywhere for 
them to go. On top of this, the gecko is only one kill off of their ultimate. Sure, backing away is an option, but something that really sucks about backing up is you kind of let the enemies out of the box. They now have more options to work with. You'll notice after the enemy sage walls our gecko off, it's going to be kind of tough for them to beat them on this rotation back towards A. On top of this, our gecko never really used their mosh pit to delay their escape either, making this play a bit underwhelming. Sure, our cypher is on A site with trips and a camera, but had our phoenix died in this duel towards the reina afterwards, we are in much less of an advantageous position than it may seem. When the enemies are stuck in B long like this, they are just as we said, stuck. They need to fight their way out, and by layering three pieces of utility on them, it's not going to be an easy fight. Especially when you're in low elo, your enemies will rarely play stuff like this perfectly. It's just a massive opportunity to make a play, which really is what ranked is all about. But once they get out of B long, they have way more options. This round ends up working out okay, and they clean up. But when we go over and look at the Radiant players, I think that you'll see a stark difference in how they push their limits and try to make plays. At the end of the day, backing up here might have actually been the correct decision, but it kind of bums me out that it seems like they backed up more because they were scared to fight and less because it was the correct play to do so. Let's move on to our second round though. In this round, our Plat Gecko actually showcases some of the right ideas. Still though, there's some things that it feels like they're missing. Here. Wait, no. Wait, wait, wait. Smoke and yours. Nice good job, Chris. Give me a leader. Give me a smoke. Take me. Sorry. Oh no, it's your own. Our hero starts out the round by contacting up A main. Their plan is to grab the ultimate orb and then pop out onto site. This isn't a horrible plan, although I probably would encourage using some form of utility to take this space anyway. Because they can just pick Dizzy back up after using it, oftentimes what you'll notice the Radiant players do is default towards these sides of the map and use Dizzy very early on into the round to take space. It doesn't cost anything, so you might as well. It's going to make noise anyway for Gecko to pick up this ultimate orb, so it's not like this is going to be the most surprising site hit in the world anyway. So it's probably better to contact up to this first wall and then throw Dizzy to help clear this first angle. It would only give the defenders like a 1-2 to two second head start as opposed to walking around the corner, and it's a bit less risky, but not the worst thing in the world. World. From here, Gecko actually does a lot of really awesome things. I like how they layer Dizzy with Thrash to help entry, and I like how after Thrash hits the tripwire, our hero runs him back for retrieval. From here, they pick up Thrash, and then they use Wingman to plant, and then they pick up Dizzy. As we'll cover later, the optimal way to do this is to use Wingman to plant first, and then picking up Thrash and Dizzy, but they've got the right idea. From this point, our hero takes a bit more of a passive role. It seems like they're aware of the flank, but they're too afraid to aggress on it and fight it. This poses some threats in the round, because Cypher is actually going to be first contact on flank, despite our gecko being aware that it's possible. In fact, had this enemy Reyna not blinded here, Cypher likely wouldn't have been aware of this at all and he would have died. What I suggest instead is being a bit more proactive about it, maybe talking to the Cypher and asking him to fight with you. Gecko's ultimate is coming back online soon, so it's important for them to stay alive, but at the very least they could trade out the Cypher on flank to make this round a bit more clean. They land some kills though and the round plays out and they get a good win. In this round, what sticks out to me is that it seems like the gecko had the right ideas, but they aren't nearly as proactive or confident in carrying out those ideas. Finally, let's look at this last round. This is probably one of their better rounds in the game. Although they're still contacting up mid, which like I mentioned before, could get punished if they're playing against better opponents, in this case, it ends up being okay. There are a couple of risks that are taken in this round that did make me jump a bit though. The first of which ends up being this blind into art. It's okay to not use Dizzy in mid if we want to fight art. I would say that they only have two ultimate points right now, so it might be better for them to lean towards A orb or B orb right now, but if their team wanted to do a mid play, it's not the worst thing in the world. This blind is really risky though, and you generally want to avoid peeking the location that you're going to try to blind it to. By exposing themselves into the open like this, it risks them dying with utility out, and since they have spike, that would be even worse for their team. We all remember how that first round turned out, right? But hey, nobody is there and it ends up being okay. From this point, we're actually able to pick up Dizzy after scaling in with their team and prepare for the second use. Moving forward, as we're executing onto site, I like how we're using Wingman to plant the spike. I would probably recommend using Wingman to plant the spike before peeking this first corner though, and the reason for that is that enemies might be tempted to shoot it, revealing their position, if they are in 
in fact playing a main, which at this point is very likely considering we're funneling through art right now. This is part of the reason I would recommend leaning more towards A and picking up that orb in this situation rather than going all five through art. It does remove that location for the enemies to play, but because we didn't do this, this is how we need to adapt. By using Wingman earlier, it might help weed out the enemy's location and help your team prepare for that gunfight easier. As you'll notice, the enemy Reyna ends up finding a pick onto our Phoenix from A main, which is definitely what I was worried about, but our team does a good job of chasing her down and trading out this kill. We even get a second use of Dizzy to fight this, which is super cool. And we're able to pick it up for a third use. Even better. From here, we make a bit of a blunder by once again peeking with our utility out, and this time, it gets punished. It would be okay to molly like this after the Brimstone ult, but because our Brimstone is ulting them off the plant, not only is our molly pointless, it's also super risky. This mistake costs our life, but overall, this was a pretty good round. We recycled our utility often, we used our wingman to plant, and we pushed with our team. It's hard to complain about that. However, let's compare these rounds with our Radiant Gecko now. For our Radiant player, we're going to be taking a look at Sodok, who is probably one of the best Gecko players we could examine. He has professional experience playing Gecko in Tier 1 tournaments, and plays for arguably one of the best teams in the game. We'll also be taking a look at Nats, another player who is world-renowned for being one of the smartest players in the game. By comparing their two play styles, we'll be able to get a good idea of what a Radiant Gecko looks like and how you can elevate your game by applying the tricks that they use in these matches. Starting out with Sodok's game on Pearl. The bread and butter of Sodok's play on attack revolved around farming up as many ultimate orbs as possible and using his abilities as much as he can. This game starts out pretty poorly with his team going 1-4 and four in the beginning, but I want you to take a look at what's going on during all of these rounds. A large majority of these rounds, Sodok is defaulting Dizzy towards either A main or B main and prioritizing these ultimate orbs. Then, if he can, he is also always planting the spike with Wingman to rack up even more ult points. By using this, Sodok was able to get his ultimate three times this half, which is pretty freaking good considering you can use Gecko's ultimate twice a round. Even when Sodok didn't go through A or B main though, he'd still consistently be using Dizzy at the start of the round wherever he went to help his team take space. Take a look at this round right here. He starts out by throwing Dizzy towards Art to help clear out this first angle. Notice again how he does not expose himself while doing this. This is a helpful area for Dizzy to clear out while also being fairly safe to retrieve after throwing it. It may just be tempting to throw Dizzy deep into enemy territory, but by scaling up slowly like this, you can definitely get more value out of the ability a lot more safely. It's kind of funny too, because right after picking up Dizzy, the enemy Killjoy pops a molly to stall out the push. But Sodok didn't even really want to scale up further anyway, because he's still waiting on Dizzy to recharge. Sure enough, soon as Dizzy is locked and loaded, he throws him into the air to clear this next angle onto sight. Right after Harbor pops his ultimate, and once again Sodok picks up Dizzy and then uses Wingman to plant. Finally, after the enemy Neon pops her ultimate, you'll see he throws out Dizzy one last time onto sight to disrupt the retake, and then dies spraying at her body. Okay, so maybe the end of this round wasn't the best example, but Sodok used Dizzy three times in 50 seconds in this round. He just kept scaling up. He'd clear one corner, pick up Dizzy, and then he would do it again. The amount of value that you can get out of this one ability is insane. And that's really Gecko's bread and butter, just constantly overwhelming enemies with how much utility he has. From what I've seen from watching both Nats and Sodok, they're not exactly afraid to throw everything and the kitchen sink at them. Take a look at the second round on defense, where Sodok first uses Dizzy to get info on mid, and then starts to rotate back towards B once they realize that it's a B hit. If they had used a Sova Recon to scout mid right here, they would have to wait another 40 seconds for it to come back up. But with Dizzy, 10 seconds is not a long time. As soon as he gets over towards B, he starts just throwing stuff. Mosh Pit to stop the plant, and then after he fights Halls real quick, he combos Dizzy with Wingman to make them both nearly impossible to shoot. You've gotta pick one, you can't just shoot both. This is a very 
very common gecko tactic that the best players will use to make their utility incredibly overwhelming and this is something our platinum gecko could have easily done to fight b lobby in that one round that we looked at one gecko flash will die in just one bullet but if you got little bro running at you and dizzy's flying in the sky above it's going to be very tough to stop after throwing all of this the best part is now he picks up wingman as well he's just cycling all of these abilities then once he's waiting on wingman to recharge he ults now thrash is clearing out halls for his team and applying pressure finally he tries to finish out the round by using wingman to defuse but unfortunately his teammate isn't on the same page but still isn't it just crazy how much utility this agent has when you're consciously trying to cycle all of it it feels completely overwhelming i want to dig into this comboing thing a little bit more though to give you guys a better idea in this next round you'll notice how sawdock is retaking a site and as soon as the killjoy ultimate goes off he's going to throw dizzy straight into the fray I'm going to go. Mas ele não também. Um ficou retido. Um deles está retido. Mospit! Tá longe ainda parado. Os dois, os dois. Volta a Nenê. Volta a Nenê. O tubarão. Tum, 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 tum. Pega o tubarão. Faca, 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 faca. Dizzy clears all of those close angles for his team, so they know that the last two players have to be A main. If they're on the left side, they definitely could rotate out, but if they're on the right side of A main, they are stuck. Meaning this is a perfect opportunity for Mosh Pit to potentially pick up a kill. These are the best times to use mollies, since if the player is stuck in the corner, they are going to be forced out into the open, or they'll take massive damage, likely resulting in their death. Sure enough, the enemy gecko is forced out and gets taken down. Then, immediately afterwards, you'll notice how Sawdock combos his abilities. He throws Wingman against the wall so that it will bounce back towards A main, and then he runs up and uses Thrash with this. The problem here for the enemy Killjoy is that she can't shoot both. She has to shoot one or the other. One will detain her, but one will stun her. If she reacts too late, she's going to be completely overwhelmed and will surely get either detained or stunned. Sure enough, that's what happens, and they're able to finish off the game with a very satisfying knife kill. He didn't cycle any utility in this round, but man does he make Gecko look like a great agent. Let's compare this with Nats' gameplay to give you a better idea of the similarities. These Nats clips are going to start out more on defense, and I wanted to point out how Nats plays more of a floater role for his team. And bye. Nothing to our seizures left. Or maybe he is left side. I'm waiting for a turret sensor. He seems very quick to rotate, and he doesn't want to spend too much time in an area that doesn't have a lot of action. In this first round, you're going to notice how he throws Dizzy straight into the air where it will fall right back down and he can retrieve it safely. If enemies are scaling up to mound, this will spot them and give his team info. Otherwise, if he doesn't spot anybody, it means that they must be somewhere else. There are many locations like this on all maps where Gecko can throw Dizzy straight up into the air to scout for info. The cool thing is, since Gecko could pick up Dizzy on an unlimited amount of times, so you could theoretically just consistently scout for info like this in a drawn out round. Because of this early info, Nats is able to make his way over towards B just in time to get a frag off of his Killjoy's turret. Then you'll notice right as Brimstone's smoke is about to fade, he combos Dizzy with Wingman to help him push B main. This is pretty much the exact same combo that Sawdock used to push onto site in that Pearl match. By using these two abilities together, you basically guarantee the enemies won't be able to deal with both of them. He doesn't get any kills with this combo, but I just wanted to showcase how both of these geckos are using this exact same tactic. Let's showcase another similarity in Nats' gameplay though. Check out this round later on in the defense as he's rotating over towards A site to defend. This round, Nats actually saves Dizzy at the start of the round because his teammate got a ton of info on A early. Rather than waiting for Dizzy to go all the way up and then come all the way back down, he'd rather just rotate more quickly, especially considering his Killjoy is on C site to anchor. Playing this floater role as an initiator can be really important. Although he might be able to anchor sites with his molly, Gecko is going to be a lot more powerful when assisting teammates than he is when he's playing alone. This is something our Platinum Gecko actually didn't understand on defense, and it resulted in them playing more of an anchor role on A site many times. Nats rotates all the way over towards A site and makes it there just in time to clog up the choke point and trees so that the enemies can't push out. He starts with his molly, and then once again notice how he layers Dizzy with Wingman to make it even more difficult to shoot. Many Gecko players would likely be tempted to pick up his utility right here though, and that's where Nats really shines. Of course he wants to pick up these abilities, but he knows it's not safe to do so. The enemies are likely guarding this, and if he greets too much, he'll likely overextend 
defend and die. Instead, he plays patiently. He waits, and then as soon as he hears the door for Tree shut, he slowly starts to re-clear it. Sure enough, he finds Breach guarding his orbs, and he lands a great frag in this round. You'd think Nats would just pick up these orbs now and get ready for retake, but actually, no, he doesn't do that at all. He moves quickly and immediately starts chasing the rotators into B with his ultimate. There's an argument to be made for both plays here. Most players probably would have stayed to pick up the Gecko utility, but this would have taken quite a long time. It would have given the attackers time to get settled on site and set up a post plant, potentially giving them more time in the round to make a play. However, this would also of course meant that Nats would have more utility to approach the retake, and he could have used Wingman to defuse the spike, which could potentially be a game changer. However, Nats is instead going to make a completely different decision that most players would likely overlook. Instead, Nats is going to immediately pursue the attackers, using Thrash to close the gap on them as they're setting up for the post plant, not giving them any time at all to breathe. This is incredible because it showcases how by staying on the attacker's trail, you can really limit their options and maintain the pressure in the round. This is similar to the round that we talked about with the Platinum Gecko, how instead of looking to fight with their Phoenix, they chose to lit up on the pressure and let the enemies out of the box. The more time the enemies have, the more time they have to reposition and catch his team off guard. By staying right on their tail, Nats makes it incredibly difficult for the enemies to make any sort of plays and win the round. After Nats' ultimate, he runs into sight and gets traded and his team wins the round. I think this really showcases the discipline that you'll need to train when you start to learn Gecko. You need to know when it's smart to pick your utility back up and when it makes sense to use your time somewhere else. If you've ever heard people say that time is the most valuable resource, this is kind of what it's about. Time doesn't stop spinning when you're picking up your utility and you need to determine if it's worth it or not. A great example is actually the next round we're going to look at. Nice, nice. Oh, beautiful, beautiful. One more, one more, one more. Pillar, 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 pillar. Last player standing. Pillar, pillar, close. One enemy remaining. One down. I got the spike. Sana, Sana. Got the spike, wings. Thanks, little man. Yes, we can this round starts out pretty similar to Sawdox game that we saw. Nats uses Dizzy to clear that first angle over C main and his team scales up. I did want to highlight something cool that Nats does to maximize his efficiency in this round. Notice how Nats chooses to use Wingman to plant before grabbing the ultimate orb. This is actually really similar from what we saw from our Platinum Gecko, so th they have the right idea. If Nats instead grabs the ultimate orb first and then uses Wingman to plant, it would actually delay the plant by around two seconds. But by using Wingman first, he can travel while Nats is grabbing the orb, speeding up the round ever so slightly. It's not a a massive deal, but you never know when two seconds will be the difference between you winning or losing a round. Unfortunately, in this scenario, Wingman ends up dying while attempting to plant the spike, leaving the spike in a rather unfortunate position. Nats quickly makes his way onto site and trades out the enemy breach, putting himself into a 1v1 with the enemy gecko. From here, I don't know if Nats played this clutch perfectly, but I wanted to sort of give you some insight into what's going on in this round and how you can maybe use some of these things to your advantage in the future. For starters, Nats decides to pick up Wingman while he can. The enemy gecko is likely rotating over from C and only has just arrived on site since he wasn't immediately trading out the breach. This means he could be in one of three locations. He can either be waterfall, CT spawn, or flanking from attacker spawn. Because Nats doesn't know where the enemy gecko is, it would be very dangerous for him to plant the spike right now. Luckily, he's playing gecko, and he just picked up his wingman, so he doesn't have to. Nats is going to wait for wingman to come back up so that he doesn't need to risk planting the spike himself. You might say, well, if he had time to pick up wingman, why can't he just plant the spike? Which is kind of actually valid. But but you need to recognize that there's more value that Wingman provides than just saving you time. Because he can use Wingman from far away, he can make sure that he is never in a bad position for the rest of the round. If Nats went to plant the spike himself, it's not just costing him the time that it takes to plant the spike, it's also putting himself in the middle of the site, forcing him to have to reposition afterwards. At any moment, the enemy gecko could be fighting him, so it's just not a risk worth taking. While Nats waits for Wingman to come off a cooldown, in the meantime, you'll notice how he quietly clears out the angles around him 
and making sure that the enemy gecko isn't scaling up. You'll notice how he clears his way back towards mound to see if the enemy is flanking, and when he doesn't see him, he concludes that he must be either waterfall or CT. From here, Nats uses wingman to plant the spike. At this point, it's very unlikely that the enemy gecko is going to be flanking. So from mound, Nats can keep all of his duels in front of him, regardless of where the last player is, making it far more likely that he wins the round. Now, many of you may think that this is a misplay because wingman actually runs directly in front of waterfall and spawn while going to plant, so that he easily could have been killed, leaving the spike in a worse location. However, had the enemy gecko shot wingman on his way to plant the spike, he would have revealed his location, giving Nats a better idea of how to approach the round anyway, so it wouldn't be all for nothing. Overall, though, this is a really cool round. Just some really small nuances when using wingman that really showcases how much Nats is actually thinking about time during his round. He's making sure to use wingman before grabbing the ultimate orb. He's waiting on wingman to come off cooldown so he doesn't have to force himself into a bad position during the clutch. It's just really patient and smart and cool to watch. All right, now let's take a deep dive into what we learned about how to play gecko though. To start, let's talk about frequency. Our radiant gecko uses his abilities significantly more than our platinum gecko. This isn't just about spamming abilities, it's about constantly reclaiming them throughout the round and occasionally unloading everything at the enemy for an overwhelming push. One of the key differences lies in the use of Dizzy. This ability is a staple for the Radiant player during the default at the start of the round, used as a tool to scale up throughout the map. Nats and Sawdok have a knack for nabbing ultimate orbs during every single round using this strategy. The Platinum Gecko, on the other hand, tends to hold onto Dizzy for more dire situations, potentially missing out on its full potential and taking more risks than needed. Another crucial point is how these players combo Wingman with Dizzy. The Radiant player will always protect Wingman with Dizzy, creating a formidable duo of abilities that supports his team while threatening his enemies. This smart pairing is less commonly seen in the Platinum player's strategy. Also, don't overlook how these players use Wingman for planting on offense. The Radiant player makes the most of every opportunity to plant Wingman, contributing significantly to his team's success and farming himself an additional ult orb every single round. However, the Platinum player sometimes misses these opportunities, signifying that they don't understand their role quite as well. And not only does the Radiant player plant the spike with wingman but they also defend the spike with their guns remember if you don't defend wingman while planting you might as well be sending him into his death and don't even get me started on mosh pit a molly is never a bad thing to have in an agent's kit but for the platinum player we actually pretty rarely saw them use it it's a great tool for stalling pushes as we saw from nats or you can use it to force players out of corners like we saw with sada but in most of the rounds we saw from the platinum player this was by far their least utilized ability lastly there's thrash this ability should be used early on in the round as our radiant players did often to maximize the chance to retrieve it. We even saw Sawdock combo Thrash with Wingman for an extra punch of pressure. In comparison, the Platinum player uses Thrash just a lot less. Although they took advantage of it while it was available, they weren't exactly farming ultimate orbs nearly as often as our Radiant players, so it just wasn't up nearly as often. So we've seen some clear differences in how these geckos use their abilities, but what does this all mean? How can we apply these insights to our gameplay? Well, that's what we're getting to next. If you want to get the most value out of Gecko, try to take advantage of using his abilities as much as possible possible. Remember, Gecko's abilities aren't meant to be the super impactful one-time use tool. They are meant to be less effective with a single use, but overwhelming when used over and over. You're meant to scale up as the round progresses and use your abilities each two to three times a round. Because your abilities aren't as strong alone, you need to learn to use them together. Combo Thrash with Wingman or Dizzy and Wingman or Dizzy and Thrash. Use them together so that the enemies are overwhelmed and don't know which ones to shoot. And farm ultimate orbs. This just lets you use Thrash all the more often throughout your game. You can use them twice a round, and then if you're planting every round and grabbing ultimate orbs, you can use them three times a half. That's a massive impact you could have on the game. And in matchmaking, most teams aren't even going to try to stop you, so you might as well. Finally, try to remember your role. You don't want to be anchoring or lurking, you want to be fighting. You are an initiator and your utility is a lot more impactful when helping your teammates than it is alone. You never saw our Radiant players playing alone, so why are you spending time so far away from your teammates? You will get much more value with your teammates, I promise. And that is a wrap on our journey through the gameplay of a Platinum Gecko and a Radiant Gecko. As we've seen, it's not just about the abilities you have, it's about how you use them. Picking up the abilities and pairing them strategically, using them liberally yet intelligently, and max Maximizing your utility on offense are all keys to mastering Gecko. But remember, there's no one-size-fit-all approach. Valorant is a game of adaptation and innovation. So take these insights and tips and mold them into your playstyle. Experiment, adapt, and most importantly, enjoy.
enjoy the process. As we mentioned before, also don't forget to check out our brand new Gecko course on the website. This course is built specifically for you guys who are looking to master this new agent with one of the most unique play styles in the game. We break down everything there is to know about playing Gecko and teach you all of the tips and tricks that the best Gecko players are using today. We'll teach you everything that you can't find anywhere else and get you carrying with this difficult agent in no time. As we mentioned earlier, it's all backed by our rank improvement guarantee as well, so if you don't climb while using our service, you'll get your money back. We do this because Skillcapped works, and if it doesn't work, then you shouldn't pay. So what are you waiting for? Be sure to check out Skillcapped with using the link in the description below, and we will see you there. Other than that, my name's King, and we'd like to thank you all for watching. We'll catch you in the next one.